Okay, well, welcome everyone to our webinar. So today we are joined by Dr. Ying Zhang, Senior Lecturer in Bioener Bioenergy within the Center for Thermal Energy Systems and Materials, School of Water, Energy and Environment at Cranfield University. Uh, trained as an environmental scientist, Dr. Zhang has a broad interest in bioenergy production, pollution monitoring and control, fate of pollutants in the environment. He's the academic lead of the Environmental Engineering Academic Committee with the UK Jiangsu World Class Environmental or University Consortium. Apologies. Today, Ying will discuss the opportunities of developing a phytoremediation project integrated with bioenergy feedstock production to optimize the financial feasibility and overall environmental benefits of the remediation process. And I'll now hand over to Dr. Zhang. Great. Thanks very much for your kind introduction. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for joining this session. Um, so firstly, I think I would like to thank IES for inviting me to this uh, lunchtime seminar. Uh, it's a great opportunity to talk about uh, several projects that were involved in the past, uh, using fire remediation uh, as a key, a key key enabling technology to address several of our greatest environmental challenges, including uh, soil remediation and uh, renewable energy and also resource efficiency. So uh, I think uh, we have very limited time in this session, so I'll get started. Uh, I think probably quite a few of us, quite a few of us uh, already know about the, uh, what phytoremediation remediation is, uh, but just for the benefit of anyone who isn't familiar with the subject, uh, just a very brief introduction of what uh, phytoremediation remediation is and how does it work. So phytoremediation is basically using plants and, uh, and sometimes uh, green algae to, uh, to, 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 to remove or uh, immobilize uh, environmental contaminants in water and sometimes in, it's in groundwater uh, context. But uh, I think in, in my experience, it's mainly to do with, uh, with land remediation. So uh, for the rest of the talk, uh, the subject will be, will be based uh, primarily on uh, a soil land remediation. Uh, so it is it is a biological uh, process. Uh, so the the plant um, the most of uh, the, the most of the process involved in this uh, uh, hard, hard, um, fire remediation process is uh, involves the plant uh, rhizosphere soil interactions. Uh, so any chemicals or, or heavy metal um, elements in the soil will be um, uh, will be uptake uh, will be will be uh, absorbed by the soil uh, by, by the root root system and taken up into the biomass. Um, and in some uh, in some in some cases for certain elements and um, the when extraction is not possible the um, the soil, uh, the, the the root system will create a sort of a negative pressure to 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 restrict the move uh, the mobility of uh, of such elements. So that will make the uh, the source uh, pathway receptor uh, part, um, uh, uh, link break in the middle. So that will reduce the environmental risk of uh, of that type of uh, uh, contaminants as well. The phytoremediation project is very popular in uh, in some part of uh, of China. I mean, a lot of projects I've involved in the past uh, is in collaboration with uh, with research groups in China. And this is because the I think there are multiple reasons that firstly, it is uh, it is the how the remediation project is funded. Uh, so in China, uh, most of the remediation is funded by the government. Uh, and then secondly, uh, the, the scale, the, the volume of the land generally is very large. And uh, so uh, what we tend to do in the, in the West using uh, you know, the, the conventional dig and dump process is not viable for such a large, vast area. And uh, fire remediation because it's, uh, uh, it involves less uh, labor and construction. Um, it's it's a sort of a preferred uh, remediation technology in in China, uh, so the primarily the strategies for phyto remediation is phyto extraction. So basically, you're using a a, a, care, a very carefully selected plant uh, to extract to to take up the um, 
uh, most often it, it is a heavy metal elements from the soil. And so it accumulates in the, so uh, in the plant biomass. Uh, so by the time you harvest the soil bio, uh, the plant biomass, um, you would hope the majority of the, uh, the contaminants will be, will be absorbed in the biomass, leaving a, a relatively cleaner uh, soil. Uh, I think the, uh, the first graph on the left, it is the, it is a, a arsenic contaminate site uh, from, a, uh, from a mining site and they are growing Teres uh, vitata is a, is a firm species as known for, uh, uh, for as a hyper accumulator for arsenic. Uh, and for other type of uh, uh, heavy metals, I think, the graph on the left hand side, top uh, left hand, uh, sorry, top right hand side, is uh, it's uh, uh, it's a cadmium uh, contaminated site. Uh, so because cadmium is uh, it's very difficult to be accumulated by uh, by a plant by any known plant. So in this particular case, it has been uh, uh, so. What we've been doing is to use chemical immobilization plus uh, the planting of uh, economic plants, which is sugarcane, to restrict the movement of uh, of the cadmium. And 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 always, it's a good practice to uh, to use intercropping to maintain the soil uh, conditions. So there's a lot of uh, uh, project in the past. Uh, we, what we, what we have tried. In, in, in those projects, we're using intercroppings. Uh, very often, we're using uh, hyperaccumulators uh, in combination of uh, economic crops. So uh, as long as you, you, you select uh, the economic crops carefully um, to make sure the product is not, doesn't contain uh, contaminants, um, you, you can get a certain amount of uh, you know, uh, produce and income from that uh, contaminated land as well. So that's the uh, that's what we try to get the uh, the uh, economic model uh, work for the phytoremediation work. Uh, so in the UK, it's very different uh, comparing uh, in comparison to to uh, the situation in China. Uh, so in the UK, um, the contaminant land remediation mainly dealt with uh, uh, within. Uh, uh, by, by two different routes. And the first one is, uh, uh, I'm sure you're all familiar with, is the Part 2A of the Environmental Protection Act. Um, so this is, um, uh, so this is the end of the Environmental uh, Act and the government will identify the, uh, the responsible person or organization for the, uh, for the contamination and um, uh, if they can identify the responsible party, um, uh, the, the remediation cost uh, um, will be paid by the responsible party. But because of the long legacy uh, of our, the, you know, the industrialization in the UK, not all uh, legacy sites can be found uh, a responsible party to pay for the remediation. And so that's, so that's causing a lot of problems financially to the government. Um, so the vast majority of recent uh, land remediation is being carried out under the planning scheme. So uh, what it is is the the land developer is paying as, uh, is paying for the remediation of the land as part of the uh, of the the planning agreement. So if you want if you are if you're a land developer, if you want to develop a particular site, um, so to, to get the, the planning permission, you will need to get the land uh, remediated uh, first. So that's obviously um, working at the moment. I think it's more than nearly 100% of the site remediation has been carried out uh, under the planning scheme. But that's, that's fine for high valued land properties in, in areas such as London, but uh, uh, for areas which the land development value is relatively low, the, the remediation costs, uh, because of the high cost, is always difficult, but that doesn't mean the contaminants and pollution um, uh, is not there. Um, 
it's just bec it's just because of the lack of the fundings they're being ignored but still posing risk to ecosystem public health and also you know the water systems uh, so we talked about the fire tool mediation as a low cost solution so can fire tool mediation be used in the uk uh, or similarly in, the, in in European countries, which has a sort of similar problems uh, to address the soil land remediation problem. So we need to think about firstly, uh, although it is a low cost, uh, and in the in the West, the because of the high labor costs and the crop uh, for fire remediation still requires maintenance. So it is low cost, but it's not free. And we still have to find someone to pay for the remediation. And uh, as long as the, the, re the, the remediation project is, uh, is profitable, you can attract certain investors uh, to invest in the remediation. But at the moment, it's very difficult to make any remediation project profitable. And especially when you, when you consider uh, by the end of the remediation, you end up with a large quantity of uh, phytoremediation waste, uh, which is a biomass possibly highly contaminated with uh, uh, heavy metals, uh, which is accumulated during the phytoremediation process. So if those contaminate, contaminants level are high enough, these uh, biomass waste will be categorized as a hazardous waste. So the disposal of those wastes will be, will be very expensive. So, so considering all those risks is a very, there, there's very few uh, fire to remediation projects has been uh, carried out in the UK uh, um, for the last uh, 10, 20 years. So this is the so this is basically the dilemma we're having with the with the land remediation. So moving on to another problem we are having uh, to our society is the renewable energy. So there's a carbon neutral energy source. Um, so I think. Um, this has been very widely debated. Um, so how can we develop a sustainable uh, um, uh, energy supply uh, without, uh, the without the carbon dioxide emission or reducing the current uh, uh, carbon dioxide emission percentages? So bioenergy using uh, organic waste uh, and biomass uh, from energy crops and that's a possibility, but uh, although we have uh, many technologies to convert those uh, feedstocks, uh, including you know, biological process, uh, um, things like uh, anaerobic digestion or you know, thermochemical processes using combustion, uh, pyrolysis or gasification technology to convert biomass uh, into, into uh, into heat and uh, and bio oil and uh, and syngas for energy production and these technology itself it's they they are relatively mature but there's a lot of debate around uh, using those technology whether they are genuinely uh, sustainable if you are thinking about um, if you are growing energy crops on arable land and so the, uh, there's a famous debate uh, about whether you are prioritizing energy production uh, to, fo uh, to food production. There are many countries in the world uh, which uh, you know they have food uh, supply and security problems. So are we satisfy the you know the develop developed countries need to produce energy first uh, or are we going to produce sufficient food to feed? The, the whole world. So that's a, so that's a debate. Uh, that's the fundamental debate uh, to bioenergy. And um, uh, I think we are we, we have moved from the first generation of the uh, the, re, the bioenergy feedstock, which is the uh, energy crop, slowly towards the second generation of feedstock, which is uh, mainly waste based, um, to produce sufficient. Uh, uh, feedstock for bioenergy production. Uh, first of all, we need to think about where do you find the, the land to produce all this, uh, uh, this bioenergy uh, crops. So, so um, in the last 20 years, 
it is very clear to all our environmental scientists, you know, using arable land, and um, that's a, not an option. We, we, do need, we, we do need those land to produce food. And we have to be very careful with, you know, uh, the carbon and, uh, and nutrient resources within the soil. Um, to simply uh, grow energy crops on arable land to, to produce bioenergy is not, a, is not a sustainable way to go forward. Um, so now, if you think about it, um, what we just talked about, the, renew, the, 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 the contaminated land resources, and, and then the, uh, which obviously the contaminated land, you can't, you, you can't use the contaminated land for, uh, for food production, but can we use this contaminated land for, uh, for bioenergy production? I mean, that's a, that's a really interesting, that's a really interesting research question. So I think to address that research question, there's, a, there's a quite a few questions we need to answer first. Uh, so firstly, uh, do we know the, the volume of the contaminated land and to, to enable a, a, a substantial amount of a, a bio, a bioenergy feedstock to, to, be, uh, to be produced? So several uh, survey has been carried out in the past. Uh, I think this is a very interesting uh, statistic I would like to share with you all. So globally, uh, it is estimated and there are 385 to 472 million hectares of abandoned marginal land, uh, which, are, which cannot be used for uh, agriculture uh, to, produce, uh, to produce food. And these contaminations are mainly heavy, uh, heavy metals. And so for most of the, the crops we grow, especially wheat and, in, uh, and, and, and rice, um, the, uh, a lot of the heavy metal will be accumulate within, uh, within the food produce. Uh, so you won't pass the food standard uh, if these lands are used for uh, food production. However, if these land are, are used for energy crop production, uh, so if we are estimate based on the an average um, energy energy crop uh, yield, um, so these these land can potentially produce um, around about uh, eight thousand uh, sorry one thousand eight hundred to two thousand two hundred milliton of oil equivalent of bioenergy if these land are used for uh, energy crop production. Okay, and, and just put, in, put that into perspective. So in 2019, the, uh, the global energy production is, uh, is 14,737 milliton oil equivalent. So the energy, the bioenergy produced from, potentially produced from those uh, contaminated land, it's almost equivalent to around about 15% of the world total energy production, potentially, if all those land are used for bioenergy, uh, energy crop production. So that's a tremendous amount of, uh, of potential, potential there. So within, within the UK, um, this, is a, this is a research we've done uh, several years ago with DEFRA. So what we're, what we're trying to find out is uh, what are the main causes of contaminations in the UK? So what we found is, uh, uh, although you know we talk a lot about uh, inorganic, uh, you know, pesticide or hydrocarbon contaminations, but in the UK and most of the European countries, metals and metalloids, so what we commonly known as the heavy metal elements, these are the these are the the, uh, the most significant contaminants, and these contaminants, um, um, the conventional chemical or biological process, you can't, you can't remove this or degrade those uh, metal elements from the soil. But, but phytoremediation, it is a suitable, it is a suitable remediation technology for those, uh, for those priority uh, contaminants. And, and if we think again, so within those metals and metalloids, if we break down this, uh, this contaminants, you'll find quite a few of these metals 
they are actually quite a valuable commodities. For example, nickels, which accounts for 20% of the, the land contamination. Um, and also, you know, uh, chromiums and coppers, there, there are a large percentage of these uh, valuable uh, metals, uh, which you will find in contaminated land. So the idea is, can we do something during the fight remediation? You remediate the land, you, accum you accumulate these heavy metals uh, or metal ions in the biomass, you recover, uh, you recover the energy from the biomass, and then, and then you also recover uh, these valuable metal elements uh, as, a, as, a, as a circular economy model. So this concept, uh, this graph, uh, illustrate uh, a research I was involved. Uh, again, it was uh, probably four, five, six years ago. It's a major EPRSSE funded project, uh, how to address the, the resource efficiency problems using fire remediations to produce uh, bioenergy and also to recover uh, elemental contaminants from the soil. So now if we go, if we come back to uh, bioenergy recovery. So at the moment, there's a, there's a plethora of uh, uh, available technologies to convert biomass to energy, and um, including fermentation, you know, using fermentation to, uh, to produ produce bioethanol. This is uh, one of the approved pathway uh, for, uh, for aviation, sustainable aviation uh, fuel. And it is within, it is within the, the AST, uh, ASTM standard already. And also for there are thermal chemical conversion uh, technologies, including combustions to produce uh, heat directly and then use the heat to generate electricity, or you can, uh, or we can use gasification to produce a thin gas, which is a mixture of uh, 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 um, uh, hydrogen and uh, carbon monox monoxide. And these thin, thin gas can be can be burned um, and directly, or it can be reformed to produce different type of uh, uh, value-added uh, chemicals. Uh, or you can use pyrolysis to produce a uh, bio-oil. Uh, then again, you can use the bio-oil as a, as a liquid fuel, uh, or you can use the biogas, uh, uh, sorry, the bio-oil as a, as a precursor for uh, some other uh, high value chemicals. Uh, all this research has been done and we understand, we understand the biological, biochemical or, or thermochemical pathways very clearly. Um, uh, as I said, um, the key challenges for bio, uh, bioenergy is to identify um, um, the, the biomass feedstock to produce uh, to produce the, uh, the bioenergy and replace the current reliance on the petrol, uh, you know, the, the, the carbon, carbon based fuel. So we need to identify uh, a bio, uh, biomass feedstock resources. At the moment, this is a difficulty in bio, uh, in bioenergy research. So in terms of selecting the conversion, the bioenergy uh, conversion uh, technologies, uh, obviously, there's a, you need to understand the characteristics of the biomass. Uh, for example, if you have a uh, if you have a biomass which has particularly high uh, uh, high water uh, water content, you might want to think about fermentations. You know, more sort of a biological process to to avoid uh, uh, intensive drying process because it, it is energy intensive and. Uh, and if you have a, for example, uh, a biomass which which has a very high content of uh, of lignin, uh, you might need to think about um, uh, the uh, a pretreatment process. For example, you know delignifications, or do you want to uh, uh, to have a hydrolysis process before the for fermentation to facilitate the the conversion process? And also, you know, um, whether a, a particle size reduction is needed. Uh, before combustion, gasification, pyrolysis process uh, starts. So the, this all has to be considered. Uh, and then again, uh, it is the pollution concerns. Um, you know, we, we, we tend to think bioenergies are green, but uh, 
um, is, is, is only green if the, you know, if the process is very well designed. Uh, there, are, there are quite a few environmental problems con uh, connect, uh, related to the bioenergy production. Uh, firstly, you need to think about uh, the gaseous emissions. For example, a lot of this, uh, the combustion incineration uh, plant for, for biomass, um, the gaseous emissions uh, knocks and, and socks uh, uh, in, in, in the gaseous emission can be really high if not treated. And for, uh, for biomass uh, coming from a, a contaminated site, this is a particularly problematic um, because for, uh, you know, I talked about the, uh, the heavy metal accumulation within the biomass and heavy metals, uh, especially for, uh, for, uh, for example, arsenic and, um, and cadmium, um, they have a very low, uh, they have a very low uh, transition temperature. So, um, for for arsenic, for example, um, you you find quite a large percentage of arsenic end up in the in the flue gas rather than in uh, rather than in the in the in the solid ash residues. So these uh, uh, these uh, gaseous elemental uh, emissions are particularly hazardous uh, if uh, if you let it out directly into the atmosphere. And um, I think we, we, have, we had a project specifically dealing with that problem and trying to figure out what are the ideal operational parameters for, uh, 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 for treating uh, uh, arsenic and heavy metal contaminated bi biomass. And how do we em uh, eliminate the gaseous uh, metal or heavy metal emissions in the flue gas? And also, you know, um, the the biomass production, sorry, the bioenergy production process itself, many, pro, uh, uh, many process involved in the, uh, in the bioenergy production, they are, energy, uh, they are energy intensive. For example, I mentioned about the drying process for, for biomass before it goes in the combustion or gasification process. In the drying itself, um, it will cost a lot of uh, uh, energy to get the material sufficiently dry, and also, you know, the uh, you know we, we talked a lot recently using pyrolysis process for uh, for liquid fuel production, uh, especially for sustainable aviation fuel. But the process itself, you know, it's relatively simple to produce a, a crude bio oil. But that bio oil, the quality of it and the calorific value of that uh, bio oil, is it's um, you, you, will need, you, you will need several processes um, to upgrade that bio oil to meet the industry standard. And these, these processes very often are uh, high temperature, high pressure process. So you might end up uh, uh, spending more energy than the product, the, than the energy product itself. So that's the risk of bioenergy uh, bioenergy uh, 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 research. So you don't want to end up with uh, having a process um, which is more energy uh, intensive compared to the, the energy product uh, that the process can, can produce. So, it's, so to use biomass coming from contaminated land and to produce bioenergy, it requires a very careful uh, planning and a lot of research has to be carried out before the uh, before any projects to uh, to go ahead. So to do that, um, uh, I'll talk in a few minutes uh, how we built a, a, a quantitative a mathematical model to help making that decision. Uh, I think just uh, just for information, uh, I mentioned about uh, the uh, the heavy metal uh, or, or high value metal recovery during the uh, during the bioenergy production process. There's, there, there are a couple of projects um, and it's actually a lot of research has, has go into that. Um, more conventionally, the, the metals um, accumulated in the biomass can be, uh, uh, can be extracted using conventional wet chemical processes 
uh, from the process uh, process ash. You know, for example, if you're using uh, combustion pyrolysis process, um, with nickel, uh, it's been most successfully demonstrated in, in some recent projects. Um, and that's probably because of uh, nickel has the um, has the largest uh, uh, th there's a large there's a large family of uh, nickel hyper hyper accumulators um, which can be applied for, uh, as a, as a uh, as a plant for high, uh, for, for nickel uh, phyto remediation. Um, there's a there's a famous uh, French group based in uh, University of um, Lorraine. And the 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 um, they are specialized in uh, in wet chemical process to to re, uh, to recover metal from uh, from phytoremediation and biomass. And more interestingly, uh, we have been uh, collaborating with uh, with a synthetic um, biology group in Edinburgh in the in the in a previous project. Um, so what we propose in this project is to use a synthetic project a synthetic biology method using a, a genetic modified um, uh, sulfur redu uh, sulfate reduction uh, bacteria. Uh, so that particular type of a bacteria can produce nanoparticles with certain uh, specific uh, functionalities uh, from, the, uh, uh, from the treated uh, uh, um, process, uh, uh, process ash uh, coming from the, uh, the bioenergy process, uh, production process. Uh, so if you can see um, in this graphs, uh, nickel, platinum, uh, palladium, and arsenic uh, uh, nanoparticles are forming um, around the the bacteria surface. Um, there, there has been a couple of interesting paper that's been published um, quite recently. If you are interested, um, there are some reference uh, just under those uh, those figures. Ying, just to say we only have about 10 minutes left, um, so okay. we need to move on to questions soon. Thanks. Sure. Uh, so just very quickly to go through a quantitative model which helps, uh, which helps to, uh, to, uh, to identify whether uh, a fire remediation project can be successful. And by successful, I mean whether it can be profitable because for um, for a commercial project to uh, to go ahead, you need you really need to understand um, how the the financial model stands. For for fire remediation, um, so I talked about um, the rent the, the, the revenue income the revenue generating uh, can be from several aspects. First, firstly, it is the income from the biomass yield. So you produce uh, uh, the biomass, um, which can then and uh, convert into bioenergy, and then the these energies can be can be feeding to the grid, uh, uh, if they are converted into electricity, or they can be sold as a as a crude as a raw material bio oil for uh, for subsequent upgrading. Uh, and also, you know, if you have if you are recovering um, uh, metal elements from the the process uh, ash, there's a uh, there's a market value for for the convert for the recovered uh, for the recovered metal, and also you need to consider all the cost involved in the bio, uh, in the phytoremediation process. For example, you know the maintenance of the crop, uh, you know irrigation, fertilizer, and labor, and also you know the the cost for uh, for the you know the, the bioenergy process, and uh, and you know the the metal recovery process. Um, so all the operational uh, operational expenditures related to the fire remediation uh, integrated with energy production and uh, metal recovery. So this, all these elements, all these revenues needs to be explored. Okay, so so once you consider all those uh, all those aspects, um, so we we develop this uh, very simple uh, financial viability uh, formula. Uh, it looks complicated here. But 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 really, it it is the uh, it, it calculates the profit uh, by uh, by adding the the value from uh, from metal recovery and plus the value from energy uh, produced during the process 
and minus the costs, for example, costs to grow plants and costs for, for metal recovery, uh, etc. Okay, so I don't want to go into detail about how those are calculated, but this is basically the, the concept. So once we started thinking about the, uh, the financial model and, uh, and we started to gather um, uh, the input data for the financial model. For example, you know, we started to think about uh, the biomass yield uh, for, for a particular crop that potentially can grow on a phyto, uh, on, for the phytoremediation project. But then we soon discovered these data, uh, you know, you collected from historic, uh, historic uh, uh, um, record or literature paper, they are not deterministic. So in another word, um, uh, if, if people asking you, uh, what is the yield uh, of, uh, of a particular plant, uh, you can't give them a, a single, a simple answer. And so once we, we compiled all the data set together, uh, it's very clear um, we, can, we can plot a distribution of, uh, of that input data. For example, uh, the annual, annual yield of a, uh, of a of certain type of crop. Uh, you can plot this distribution, for example, um, the probability of having, um, let's, let's say, 10, uh, 20, 100 kilograms of dry biomass, biomass per hectare is 20%. There's a 20% uh, probability to, to produce uh, that amount of biomass, and there are a uh, forty uh, percent probability to produce, uh, let's say, sixty percent, uh, sixty kilograms of that particular biomass. So they are not deterministic, um, but by using this distribution as uh, as input uh, data set to the financial model, it gives uh, it gives a very unique uh, opportunity to look into the uncertainty. Um, uh, so, so the the risk of the of the financial mod, uh, the, the financial viability of the of the project, which is truly valuable for for the for any commercial project and to the industry. So, as a case study, uh, we applied this uh, this uh, probabilistic this uh, uncertainty uh, financial this risk model on two different scenarios. So, one is the uh, one is using uh, using Teres Vitata, which is the known arsenic hyperaccumulator uh, for treating arsenic contaminated sites and, and comparing that to a different crop, uh, a common sunflower, um, and, and, and comparing the potential uh, outcome, the financial outcome of a phytoremediation uh, integrated with the bioenergy production project. Uh, so I think, um, in academia, uh, a lot of plant scientists, when it comes to phytoremediation, we are very, we're fascinated of using what we refer to as hyperaccumulator. So those plants have a very high affinity, very high biological uh, accumulation factor for, uh, uh, for metals and contaminants. But um, in reality, if we are applying these type of plants, in, in a phytoremediation project, the results might not be uh, as good if you're applying for, uh, for a plant which has a high uh, biomass yield, because although you know, the, uh, the, the, the hyperaccumulator can accumulate lots and lo you know, high concentration of uh, uh, contaminants in the biomass, but because of the, the, the total biomass, biomass volume it produced, uh, the total recovery of the contaminants is quite small. Okay, so there's a gentle balance we need to explore. So that's the purpose of using this uh, uh, risk model to understand the, uh, the outcome of a, of a project. It's just very quickly to show what the data, input data distribution looks like uh, on this slide. And, um, and also the, the outcome of the financial, uh, financial uh, out, uh, outcomes. So when using, uh, when using a low biomass yield, uh, Teres vitata, although it, it accumulates high concentration of 
uh, of, uh, of arsenic in its biomass. The, because of the low biomass yield, you end up with less income from, uh, from the energy pr uh, produced uh, from the, you know, the bioenergy bio process. Um, so the probability results shows there's a 57% there's a uh, probability you will end, the project will end up profitable, but uh, at a very low, uh, very low margin, um, uh, around about you know, um, for, for less than 120 pound per, per hectare. And there's a quite significant risk, 41%, uh, which uh, the project will make a loss. So that's for Terris vitata. But if you're using a high biomass yield plant, uh, the common flower, the common sunflower, the, the outcome is quite different. So if you can see from the graph on the left, um, there's a very high certainty of making, uh, of making a, a significant um, um, a profit in between. So 90% of the probability uh, the project will generate a profit uh, from 1,200 to around about 2,000 per hectare. Okay, so th I think these are the, uh, the main point of the financial model. So I think we can move on to the, to, the, to the question and answer part now. Thanks very much. Great. Thank you so much, Ying, for that amazing presentation. Um, it looks like we have lots and lots of questions and comments, so that's really great. Um, we'll jump into some questions from the audience. So the first one is, are all the plants used vascular cropped annually, or are woody plants, shrubs, trees used to accumulate certain contaminants and provide wood-based bioenergy? Um, I think that's a very good question. Uh, so um, the plant selections for phytoremediation has to be very specific. Um, so it, it needs to build into the overall planning of the, uh, um, if we're considering, you know, the whole process has to be a profitable. Um, uh, for annual crops, um, if you are, annual crop is good for, uh, if you are generating, you know, if you're considering uh, a, a consistent uh, production of biomass, which you can harvest every year, and then uh, and then convert that biomass uh, into into energy. And if you obviously for that for that particular scenario, you will require a lot more crop maintenance, so the operational cost will be higher. So you need to consider that. Um, so if you want to leave the plant in the field, just as a as a method to immobilize and reduce the environmental risk of that contaminants. Uh, that can also be an option. Um, obviously the crop maintenance, uh, maintenance will be very, will be much lower. And so the operational cost will be low. So depending on what you want to do with the crop and also you know, the, the overall um, target, the aim of the project. Great. The next question is, um, am I missing the impact uh, and cost of disposing and processing the contaminated biomass from re remediation and the risk of the contamination drawn upon into the food corps, food crops, sorry. Surely the LCA will show this to be counterproductive in the cost benefit calculations. So the impact uh, and cost of disposing processing the contaminated biomass. Yes, uh, we actually we had we had a paper published uh, uh, um, specifically studying the uh, you know the the, the whole process uh, based on a, a sort of a LCA uh, uh, style study, and obviously you know the disposing and uh, of the biomass is a significant problem, um, but uh, that can be addressed if um, if the uh, the fire remediation uh, process is integrated with uh, with the bioenergy production process. Um, as, uh, uh, the the bioenergy production and the process and technology is all very you know it's it's very well studied and understood, and all the uh, you know the contaminants pollutant pollutions related to bioenergy production is all very well understood. So there are tech, there are measures. Uh, in place um, to to control the uh, you know the emissions that sort of things, um, and that's to eliminate to or and reduce the impact from disposing of contaminated waste and biomass. Uh, it's 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 the main it's the main point of why 
uh, you know, bioenergy process is, is needed uh, as, a, as, a, uh, as a downstream process for fire remediation projects. Great. Um, so the next one is, are there any facilities in the UK that will process contaminated plant biomass at scale? This is where my own research and now work to get industry buy-in hits a wall. Mm. Yes, I think uh, at the moment, uh, I don't think there's any plant, there's any incineration plant uh, that, de that deal with uh, contaminated uh, biomass specifically. But, uh, you know, it really depends on the level of contaminations. Uh, I think there are clear guidelines for, um, you know, if the contamination reaches a certain level, these, these biomass will be categorized as a hazardous waste. So it has to be dealt um, uh, in, 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 in specific uh, plants. But if, you know, I think in most of the cases, mm, certainly in, in some of the, uh, in the project, you know, the pilot scale project I came across in, in, in China, I mean, the, the contamination in biomass is not that low, so it can be dealt with uh, uh, in, you know, in ordinary uh, incineration waste, man waste management uh, facilities. And I, I think in terms of, uh, you know, industry buy-in, this is, a, I mean, the, the fire remediation integrated with bioenergy, I mean, it's, it's a multidisciplinary research and if we want, you know, we, we try to, to engage with industry in previous project, but because it's, you know, it involves a lot of sectors, you know, many stakeholders, uh, including the governments, regulators, uh, uh, and, you know, environmental engineering sectors and, uh, and the renewable energy sectors. So to have that uh, to, to have that sort of a joint force or the stakeholder engagement is essential to uh, uh, to push this uh, this technology uh, to a wider market. Perfect. Okay. Um, so this one asks, how safe is phytoremediation tech to reduce heavy metals? Uh, gosh. Um, Say well, sorry. So, so so as a as a as a technology, I mean, growing plant on the on a contaminated site, I, I would imagine it's fairly safe. Uh, I think the the risk uh, the risk related to to this whole process is the potential, you know, emissions pollutions uh, during the uh, uh, you know if we are adopting a sort of a thermochemical process to treat the uh, the remediation uh, biomass waste. So. I've mentioned um, previously, you know, arsenic, uh, cadmium uh, can, can emit as a, as a gaseous um, pollutant in the flue gas. So, you know, if that's not controlled, obviously there will be an environmental risk related to that. Um, so the next question is, does phyto extraction usually need more than one crop cycle? What happens to the cam contaminated vegetation? Contaminated vegetation? Uh, well, I think the contaminant vegetation, you know, every time you harvest the biomass, it will be treated uh, within the, the bioenergy conversion process. So you will produce bioenergy from the biomass, the contaminated biomass, and uh, the contaminations, uh, if you control the process very carefully, most of the contaminations, um, and heavy metal especially, will remain in the process ash. So it's a condensed form of the contamination. So that can be treated in um, more realistically at the moment, you know, is by wet chemical process, you can recover these, uh, these contaminants, uh, heavy metals. Great, okay, so the next one is, I saw something similar to this being proposed in Wales to remove mining heavy metals using vigorous non-native species. However, mm -hmm. what are the considerations regarding non-native -na invasive species potential? Uh, well, you know, obviously the the selection of the plant needs to be needs to be very careful. Um, so I think f f um, when 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 we were working on phytoremediation projects, you know, especially as a as a sort of a academic project, there's a lot of a plant scientists involved in this process. So sometimes we we go a bit uh, we, we get enthusiastic about uh, you know the select selecting very novel plant to uh, so there are plants, for example, uh, they, are, they, are, they are definitely not indigenous to the UK. Um, um, uh, 
because of certain certain properties um, we, we we think that might be interesting to 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 test in the field um, but uh, you know you need to think about whether this plant will be you know um, causing uh, you know ecological um, problems to the you know to the local species and also simply you know they might not survive to the UK climate that's uh, that's one of the that's one of the probably the first concern you know you're starting to grow a different species and um, and also you know it's um uh, I've mentioned uh, in my talk it's uh, I think most of the academic research starting sort of thinking about oh I will use this hyperaccumulator which accumulate you know, very high concentration of contaminants. But in reality, you know, if you are, um, if you really want the the fire remediation as a commercial viable uh, project, you know, it, you, you might not need the plants to be a hyper accumulator. It can be a high yield, high yielding um, uh, uh, energy crop, which has, you know, which, 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 which takes up Certain amount of uh, uh, um, of contaminants from the soil. I mean, that's probably uh, as a uh, as a long term target to remediate, reduce the the contaminants. But as a short target is to produce uh, energy crops to uh, to 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 maintain the you know the economic financial viability of the whole remediation project. I think for a lot of the commercial um, activities, that's. That's probably the, the 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 key point. Amazing! I think that might be all we have time for today. But thank you guys so much for asking such insightful questions. Um, that was a really interesting Q and A that we just had, and I think we have some lovely comments in the chat already thanking you, Ying, for such an amazing presentation. So I hope you guys got a lot out of that. Um, so thank you once again, Ying, for presenting. Um, that is it from us. <laughs> today. Um, so thank you for logging in. I hope you found that beneficial and informative. If you're watching this recording on YouTube, please do subscribe to our channel, like the video and hit that notification bell to get notified of new content. So thank you again, Ying and all attendees for watching today. And I hope you guys all have a great afternoon. Great. Thanks very much.